Hello and good morning, evening or afternoon, depending on when you are listening to this latest ED Susty Talk interview. This is our series of video interviews designed to keep us all feeling a little bit more connected throughout COVID and beyond. Um, and I'm delighted to have Alan from SC Johnson on the call um, today. Um, yeah, all the way from across the, the Atlantic. So how are you today? I'm absolutely terrific. Beautiful weather here in uh, southeastern Wisconsin and thrilled to be here. Great. I wish I could say the same about the weather. It's very, very grey, um, sort of end of summer. It seems to be here, um, which is disappointing, but i um, equally glad to have you on today. Um, and I wanted to touch really on, we often interview on this series, so for example, maybe Chief Sustainability Officer or Sustainability Officer, um, but your role is CCO, so Chief Comms Officer. Um, but we've spoken to Fisk Johnson, the CEO of SE Johnson before, and it's pretty clear that there is that board level top down buy in um, for sustainability. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you and your position work on that agenda and with with that team. Look, the entire corporation, starting with Fisk, um, is committed to lightening our footprint, everything from reducing carbon to using sustainable energy sources at our new headquarters where I'm sitting today and at our largest manufacturing facilities in the world and also trying to drive down our use of virgin plastic and, and create closed loop recycling um, in the communities where we live and work and also uh, in communities so we can supply uh, PCR into, into our packaging. So we're committed as a corporation to start with. And the, my, my role is both communications and government relations. So I work with our sustainability folks, our supply chain folks, our product design folks, everyone in the C-suite to build relationships with stakeholders that are critical to addressing the issues of lightening the footprint that business has on the planet. So I can imagine you're very busy <laughs> I was going to say at the moment, but all the time, really. <laughs> Look, it's it it's it's always on. Let let's use kind of a social media phrase, right? It, it's always on, and it's always on because you're seeing new innovations, um, like the plastic bank, which we're talking about today. So we're always sourcing for innovative solutions to help reduce our use of packet of uh, plastic and virgin plastic in our packaging and to lighten our footprint. So we look for people that are innovating constantly which is how we found the plastic bank and started the partnership we're going to talk about in a little while. Mm, I was going to say, so out of all of that, I would like to focus on the materials today because essentially I got an email um, earlier this year saying that essentially the plastic bank SC Johnson partnership has um, got its billionth bottle worth of plastic essentially and this is a partnership we covered um, when it first launched um, but it would be good to hear a little bit about how that that came about and how that has scaled and evolved um, since then because I feel like all too often we get the the starting announcement um, and that's it we might not hear much thereafter. Well look our uh, there are many uh, directions to take that question but I'll start with this. Fisk um, identified plastic as a significant issue. He's a he's a committed environmentalist and a passionate diver. And you know, in addition to watching the trends in packaging, he also saw a lot of ocean plastics in his dives. And he decided that we as a corporation need to, to start address addressing that and our own packaging and shift to um, PCR as much as possible. We're up to 62% of our packaging is PCR now. But as well as he wanted to address the ocean plastics crisis. So we um, identified a significant, well over half of the problems in Southeast Asia, and we identified the plastic bank as potential partners to collect ocean bound plastic and then to ship it to our facilities in the United States and to help turn that into packaging in the US for our Windex product. So we started a partnership with the Plastic Bank in 2019. You referenced that announcement with nine collection facilities in Indonesia. We're working on building up to 300 facilities across Southeast Asia. We've expanded into two facilities in Brazil and we're working right now at the Plastic Bank to look at, at the feasibility of expanding our partnership into East Africa. So we're, we're very focused on expanding that and decreasing our dependence on virgin plastic. 
And we can come on to sort of learnings from setting up and scaling partnerships in a bit, but I wanted to touch on there. So you mentioned that obviously that this is working on ocean bound plastics. Um, and in a few articles I've done this year where that's mentioned, people say, well, how actually do we um, define that? Do different companies define that in, in different ways? Yeah. So SC Johnson, the plastic bank define ocean bound plastic as plastic that is accumulating in an area that does not have recycling capabilities or infrastructure and within, is within um, 30 miles of ocean bound waterways. Hmm. So sort of the likelihood is that that could find its way into the natural environment. Yeah, look, in, in Southeast Asia, if you think about it for a second, during rainy season, if you have plastic pollution on the side of riverbanks, you have a lot of rain, that rain channels the plastic into an ocean bound river and it ends up in the ocean. Got it. Um, and yeah, I guess it would be good to look into that scaling that you've mentioned is impressive. So nine facilities to, to 300 and we'll have people listening that are sustainability professionals looking to develop a good partnership on plastic waste or another material. Um, issues, but crucially to go beyond just partnering for partnership's sake, getting something that is does have a strong foundation and is scalable. So I'd love to hear about some of the company's learnings um, from the setting up and scaling process. Look, for, first and foremost, there has to be economic incentive involved for collectors, right? So what, one of the things that we really like about this is the Plastic Bank's model is based on local collectors and helping local collectors monetize the collection of plastic. So it incentivizes them to collect and to bring into collection facilities. And essentially, uh, these collectors and the economic model we put in place, they're paid with digital currency straight on to their um, mobile devices. So that helps to eliminate corruption in the system, which existed before. And what we're finding is, um, our plastic collectors make 42% more than the average income in a lot of the communities um, where we're collecting plastic. So there's a really good economic um, incentive involved for the community. So let's call it that micro enterprise is one of the key solutions to scalability. The second thing is really good creating really good recycling infrastructure. And that generally happens in partnership with local governments. So you've got economic incentive for collectors, you've got good partnerships with communities and local governments, and then you've got companies like ours who are willing to purchase this plastic at scale and put it into their packaging. So I think those, those are the key ingredients uh, that we've found. That makes sense. That covers sort of the, the whole value chain. So the chicken and the egg at, at the same time. That's right. So that makes that makes complete sense. Um, and I wanted to come on to so we've looked at plans for for yeah as you say sourcing more recycled plastic and we've talked with Fisk before about targets to um, reduce virgin plastic use and scale up um, PCR sourcing. But I'd like to hear about what else is being done to reduce virgin plastic in house and then. Also, just looking at the end of life for the stuff that has PCR in it, because recycle doesn't inherently mean um, recyclable. And obviously, it would be great if there weren't ocean bound plastics in, in the first instance. Yeah. So, look, it's a very complex ecosystem, right? Because plastic has played a really important role in things like packaging integrity and in food safety and security, right? So, I think we, we kind of have to start there to understand the growth of, of plastic as a viable packaging uh, material. And what we do know is that we'd like to eliminate as much as possible the use of virgin plastic. So we're doing things like our partnership with uh, the Plastic Bank. We're doing things like partnering with um, sports teams in the United States. I'm wearing a Milwaukee Brewers Major League Baseball um, shirt here today. They're one of our partners here where we're creating closed loop um, recycling solutions for plastic cups that are used for beverages um, in these facilities. And we turn those plastic cups into packaging for our scrubbing bubbles product here in the United States. So we're trying to move strongly into closed loop. We're also working on addressing consumer behavior. So creating refill solutions, creating concentrates, um, 
creating things that allow you to reuse a trigger up to 10,000 times. So we're doing all these kinds of things that look at uh, packaging innovation, that look at driving and addressing consumer behavior, that look at uh, extended producer responsibilities, which are putting the burden on government and on producers and users of plastics to address the issue. We don't think the consumer should carry any of the burden for this. We, we're trying to make it easier for the consumer to wean themselves off of virgin plastics. So those are just some of the things that we're doing. Great, it's really interesting to hear about the extended producer responsibility stuff, so the EPR stuff, because we've got consultations going on into that in the UK um, at the moment, but they were first flagged very end of 2018. Um, I want to say, and COVID pushed back the consultations on that um, by a year. So still waiting for a bit bit of clarity here Look, on I, that. I, I just want to say that we are 100% pro-regulation and we think regu regulation and legislation needs to be part of the solution. here. Um, we think that legislation and regulation needs to be pragmatic. Uh, we think it needs to be steeped in progressive um, goals. And we also think need, there needs to be a sharing of cost in this stuff between industry and between local governments to help put recycling infrastructure into place. But we absolutely believe the consumer should bear none of the cost responsibility for this. They're going to have a burden on them in terms of behavior change, and we're certainly willing to, to help consumers on that journey. That makes complete sense. And Alan, I'd love to stay and chat, but I feel like that's all the time we have for this interview. So thank you so much for your time. I couldn't be happier. And uh, we look forward to seeing you when we're over in the UK. And if any of your listeners want to come to the Blue Paradox, our uh, Ocean Plastics Museum in the UK in mid-September, we'd love to have